uh, uh, we can take this entire conversation forward after uh, uh, okay. after what you've seen, and then especially around the mountain economics, uh, where we are, you yourself being uh, you, having uh, you know a student uh, lived actually for a part of your life in Sikkim, so you would have your own perspective. I would want you to share that, and then we'll have a few questions and answers. Okay, thank you very much. Um... And it's a pleasure to be uh, on your show. So uh, what I'll say is that why don't I lay out some of the basic principles and then we will see how to apply those basic principles to the mountain economy. Because as you will see, um, um, the, the things that we need to think about mountain economy is not that they are exceptions to the rule, but they're special applications of the rule. So now comes the following thing. What have we in the government and how are we thinking about the whole thing? Now you read all the specific policies, so I'm not going to tell you what you read in the newspapers anyway. Uh, but what I'll do is take you through some of the thinking process behind what we are doing right now. So you'll understand why we are doing what we are doing. Now, the most important thing to understand about what we are doing is that we are making decisions in a situation with very little information and a lot of uncertainty about the future. So how do you make decisions in that environment? So so let me illustrate for you. Supposing you went back to the middle of March, before we went into the lockdown, what is the information we actually had? The information we actually had was that something really bad had happened in China, of which we didn't, weren't very sure what it was. And in fact, we even today are not entirely sure what happened in China. We also knew that this disease had spread to Italy and was killing a lot of people. And that there were some signs that it was spreading to other countries, including India. That is basically the sum total of what we knew. We didn't know the nature of this disease. We didn't know how much it has spread and why it was spreading and so on. Now, that is the context in which certain decisions had to be taken. So, of course, we called in all the experts. And we got a wide variety of, uh, of a range of uh, things that the experts told us. Some experts told us that by, if we didn't do anything, then by June, there would be some 300 million Indians who would be infected and there would be lakhs of people dead. And you will have seen many of those forecasts and uh, projections which various people had done. On the other hand, people said the, only, the best thing to do was to go for herd uh, immunity and to then do something quite minimalist, and which is what the UK initially did, uh, Sweden did, uh, even Singapore initially did, but then changed time. Now, when we realized that we had such a wide range of things that the experts were telling us, one thing we realized is that they had no idea what was going on. That is the only thing we knew for sure. So how do you make decisions when you, don't, when you know that the so-called experts really don't know? So the way to do it is something called a barbell strategy. Those of you who are from a finance background will know what I mean. Basically what you do, you hedge for the very worst outcome. And for the rest, you wait for events to play themselves out and you try and respond in a feedback loop. So this is precisely what we did. We, did, we hedged for the worst by doing a full lockdown on one hand. And then since then, we have been easing the lockdown as more information is available. Now, this explains why we are, for example, now opening up now. And many people say, why are you opening up now when there are more cases when you went into a lockdown when there were fewer cases? Now, if you know the barbell strategy, it's obvious. Why? Because, yes, it is spreading much more widely now. But we have a lot more information about it as well right now. So, for example, we know that it is highly infectious, but we also know that perhaps it is not quite as dangerous for the average person, particularly a younger population, than we had originally thought. It is still very dangerous. This is not the ordinary flu, but, uh, and it is clearly very, very dangerous for older people with comorbidities, but it is perhaps not as dangerous as many people thought when we were looking at the original Italian numbers. So we also have some idea how it spreads. We know that wearing face masks, for example, is a very important part of our response to it, and so on and so forth. So this allows us now to begin to unwind it, not only because the economic costs of it are so high for keeping the lockdown going, but also because we can now make some sensible trade-offs. In the beginning, I could not have made any sensible trade-offs. Who knows, at that stage, the information we have, it could have been a lot worse than it actually is. And then we would actually have had lakhs of people dying on the streets. 
So while we do have a difficult situation on the health front, no doubt about it, I'm not demeaning it, but I would argue that we, are, we have done perhaps the only sensible response we could have done, which is initial lockdown, get some better information, and then make the best trade-offs we can, given the information we have. Now, this is also true of the response we are doing on the economy. Because we did, we did not know how long this will last. We don't know exactly what the impact is on our economy or on the future economy. We know, however, we have made some calculated guesses. One of them is, first of all, that this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So unlike many other countries which have given huge upfront uh, revival packages, we have gone for somewhat smaller revival packages, but we have done a few and we will do more in the future as well. We have also added into it a significant dose of supply side measures, i.e. structural reforms, which most other countries are not doing, but we are also doing structural reforms. Why are we doing this? The reason we are doing this is the following, that we are very, we think that look, it is, this is a major structural shift in the world in which we live not dissimilar to the shock we had in the Great Depression and the Second World War. The last big reset of the world economy was after the Second World War. Everything changed. The game entirely changed. And then there was a small reset in 1989-90 when the Berlin Wall fell. But the real big reset of the world happened after the Second World War. Now, if we are going to have a reset of that scale now, uh, and we were due a reset anyway. I mean, many things were anyway going awry. Then one thing is very clear. We cannot assume exactly how the future of the world will be. Geopolitics of that world will be different. The supply chains of that world will be different. Human behavior and consumer behavior of that world will be different. The technology of that world will be different. You just show, and many things will change. I mean, you just showed how education may be fundamentally different into the future. Uh, and so on and so forth. So if you do not know what you are reinflating your economy back into, then you cannot very easily say that, oh, we'll spend all this money and do these things. Because you don't know what you're going to have to spend money into. What if we spend all our resources building certain kinds of factories which have no use? So what do we do? So the one thing that we can be sure about is that flexibility and adjustment matters. This we all know. No matter what happens, we'll have to be flexible. So that is one of the reasons why if you look at the policies that we are putting together under Atmanirbhar Bharat, they are all related to flexibility. And so the flexibility is related to, for example, labor laws. We are changing labor laws. Why? Because we want our labor to be flexible and be able to move into the new areas that grow rather than get stuck like in the past and then we have to protect industries which are going, becoming obsolete. Similarly, we want to privatize all non-strategic areas. Why? Because clearly private sector is able to respond to changing circumstances in which governments simply cannot do. Um, similarly, we are, for example, freeing up agriculture. We used to have these Essential Commodities Act and APMC and all of that. Most of these were failures for controlling prices, but they were real problems in terms of the way in which they used to impose all kinds of things on the farm sector, whether it's in terms of pricing, in terms of what they could grow, where they could sell it, who they could have contracts with and so on. So again, another form of flexibility, we are easing up the agricultural sector so that they are flexible. And then we are also telling states to go out there and do new things. And you've seen a few states like UP, for example, are being very flexible about this. But this is important, that you do not think of Atma Nirbhar Bharat means that everybody has to be self-reliant and flexible and, and resilient. It does not mean a return to Nehruvian import substitution. Let me clear this right up front. Prime Minister himself made this point. We have to be willing to participate in global supply chains. And we are continue to be very welcoming of foreign direct investment. This is not a change at all in that thinking process. What we are instead doing, we are freeing up individuals, companies, states, from this entire thinking process that some wise person sitting in the planning commission in the commanding heights will tell all of you what to do. So that is why I'm deliberately trying to tell you, tell you principles rather than what exactly you should do, 
because it would go against Atmanirvarta. So it is important that you understand the principles I'm coming up with. These are ways of thinking. These are not about telling what Sikkim should do or Arunachal Pradesh should do. You know what better to do. Tell me how to get out of the way and what support you need. So that is very important part of Atmanirvarta. The other important part of Atmanirvarta is be vocal about local. Struck, you know, this whole episode showed whether it's in terms of China's own response or the WHO, etc., showed how centralized systems cannot deal with uncertainty. You need decentralized systems which are freed up to do their own thing. So this is what be vocal about local really means. It's about decentralization to free you up from doing things so that we don't get in the way. Now, th there are certain things that the center still needs to do, that, but that, those relate to basically background infrastructure, whether it's soft infrastructure or hard infrastructure. So for example, if we are freeing up farmers to do whatever they want, we are also freeing them up to a national common market. So this is now open common market. You can make decisions locally, but you can sell nationally or even internationally. So this is the importance that you understand what this whole thing means. Now, these are generally all of these principles are true for every state in the country. It has nothing to do with mountain states. So I will now come to what it means for mountain states. Now, very important thing here to realize, the shock that we have gone through COVID tells us one important thing, that human beings in general, and whether it's countries, companies, states, individuals, tend to underestimate the impact of low probability, high damage events. COVID is just one example of it. And because we are facing it right now, we pay too much attention to how our lives are going to be changed by this one event. You know what, we, were, we have gone through uh, pandemics in the past as well in our history. We didn't all go back, go, go wearing uh, masks and for the rest of our lives. We, over time, these things were eased up. So I don't think we should only think about COVID as being the, the one example of a shock that can hit. What we are really to think about is the impact of random large shocks, which come once in a while, but we never pay attention to it. Now, what is that one big shock that mountain states really need to think about? And that is earthquakes. All of you are sitting on tectonic plates that are one of the most unstable in the world. Please don't worry about pandemic. We'll solve it after a you are almost certainly in the next 20 years, you are likelier to get a very large earthquake than a repeat of this pandemic. I mean, one year, two years, whenever, we'll eventually get a vaccine for it. And anyway, we may already have become immune to it by virtually many of us may have get, get this disease. But there is nothing that we are going to do to make us immune from earthquakes, which are much more, we're almost certain to have, but we just can't predict when. There are other things also that can happen. Climate change can happen. There can be very violent changes in monsoonic weather. There can be violent changes that can happen from temperatures. But do not predict exactly where this is going. Climate change, anybody who's actually looked at the climate change models will tell you this. While we can tell the things are going, obviously changing, do not be 100% sure about exactly what climate change means. It probably means uh, global warming, but once you tip an unstable system off, it can go in any direction. For all you know, we may get tipped into an ice age. So flexibility is more important, resilience is more important than your ability to predict where this will go. This is very important. So therefore, think about this very, very seriously. And particularly in the case of earthquakes and things like this, you need to begin thinking about it. Now, the good news is, our ancestors have gone through many of these many, many times, which is why if you look at traditional architecture, traditional crops, traditional food, you will see there is built into it lots of resilience. So the foods you eat, the kinds of traditional medicines and other things you are doing, they are all related to your cultural and ecological uh, footprint. So please, when we say be vocal about local, this is what it talks about. You have to be resilient at that level, number one. Number two, 
the more and the second important thing we have understood out of this is diversity matters if your economy is based on one activity no matter what that activity is you have no idea when you will get hit by something like this so so for example um many of the hill states are dependent on tourism and suddenly because of something which is completely unrelated to hill states by the way it has completely come to a grinding halt it just disappeared now <clears throat> this can happen due to other reasons as well it could be because of a war it could be because of a reason i you and i haven't even thought about but this tells you something when you are thinking about your economy you cannot base the whole idea on one what thing no matter what that one thing is even tourism cannot be it is obviously it will continue to be an important thing i don't think this covid is going to mean that we will never again go on holidays to the mountains we will but this is true for any other activity you do whether it's growing um, apples in himachal or growing plums in ladakh suddenly you know some weather freak weather or virus or something happens and your crop is gone so no one activity doesn't matter what that one activity is you always have to have certain amount of diversity into your systems so that you think about it third thing is to think about how you manage local culture and manage human capital and human agglomeration this is may not be so true i don't know enough about uh, uh, about sikkim's current position but certainly one of the things we are discovering in sir, uh, states like uttarakhand himachal etc uh, maybe even to some extent in kashmir is that the best human capital is just getting up and leaving moving to delhi mumbai wherever the younger population the best quality of that younger population is moving this relates to the previous point about resilience if if your best guys leave then you will not be able to create any other engine of growth other than the lowest common denominator of some sort um even even tourism requires certain kinds of talent unless you're just going from cheap mass tourism uh, even high quality tourism requires certain amount of talent and you need architects you need people who are into hospitality and so on and you need to be able to retain your human capital but here is something interesting also to attract good quality capital to you from other parts of the country to yourself so let me give you one example you travel across the length and breadth of india one interesting phenomena will come to you that virtually all of the second line of people who work in hospitality come from india's northeast okay you go to any major uh, uh, hotel anywhere in the country The, the 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 chief chef chef will probably still come from kerala or odisha or some such place but his assistant is probably from assam or uh, meghalaya or, or nagaland the front desk uh, will all very likely be a lady from uh, many manipur or some such thing this is very very common across the country this is very good for the rest of india we are very grateful for the contribution you are making but sadly when i go to nagaland or manipur i simply do not see the equivalent five star hotels there where are the great five star mizo hotels why is it that when i go to uh, darjeeling for example uh, there is that one old british era hotel that is of real high quality but most of the rest of the places are actually worse than what i remember it from my childhood and even uh, sikkim which does have a handful of really high quality institutions now hotels and things but frankly you know you, you should be pitching yourself at a much higher level than you are just look next door at what bhutan has done and there's more money ironically there's more money to be made in it also and all of this is being provided by your human capital going to the rest of the country sikkim is not usually the source of it though i have to say Uh, you haven't had the same level of brain drain but i do see nagaland manipur meghalaya all these states you go here in delhi you go to all these fancy restaurants half of the staff there is from these states but why is it that they, i can't go to shillong and have the same meal or the same hotel 
Although in near Bodapani also now I recently came across one nice hotel in Shillong. But the, you know the point I'm making. You are losing your human capital. You need to find avenues for keeping it. Again, this is about being vocal about local. Uh, Ladakh is again a good success story on this as well. But this also leads through to another issue about maintenance of culture. People don't come there to see the same CPWD construction they can see back in, uh, back in wherever they come from. Please maintain your culture. Sikkim, I think you need to ban construction of CPWD designs and go back to building. I, again, something Ladakh is doing very well. And Bhutan is also doing very well. And you need to go back. And Sikkim, of course, has not just uh, old uh, Bhutia style architecture. You also have Nepali, Lepcha, other kinds of architecture as well. You have dresses, you have different kinds of culture. Please preserve it. It's a very important part of who you are, even from a tourism perspective, but also from a resilience perspective. Uh, similarly, Arunachal Pradesh has a lot of local tribes with unique culture. Each valley has a unique culture, language, etc. These are very important part of being vocal about local. Please preserve these. These are important parts of what we have to do. But at the same time, you, that does not mean just like Apna Nirvarta does not mean closing off India into a import substitution, Nehruvian isolationism. It means being open to the world as well. Um, India will continue to be open to the world. And so do these states have to be open to the rest of the world. You, you know, technologies will change and so on. And there are digital platforms. Tourism, as I said, will continue to be. But there are certain areas where you may have to actually import people because you need to get human capital to come and stay there. I mean, when you go, for example, you go up in a place like Masuri. What is the joy of Masuri? You know, all of us have grown up reading the writings of Masuri-based writers. And that's why Masuri feels like an interesting place. Um, so, you know, you need people to move there. How you manage that to getting good quality uh, cap human capital to move there. But there is, at least in some states, a geopolitical reason for it as well. Uttarakhand, for example, has seen a mass movement of people from the border areas to areas uh, in the plains or even closer to the plains. As a result, this is something we need to think about. If border areas do not have active populations of Indians living there, there is always a danger of some future date these getting occupied by people. We do not want them there. So this is an important thing that even Sikkim needs to think about, Arunachal needs to think about. You need to have connected populations of Indians living along these areas. Where, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, if everybody moves from North Sikkim to Gangtok, uh, that's not a good thing. So you need to protect your North Sikkim, uh, the people who are living in the border areas with uh, Tibet, um, in Uttarakhand, Himachal, etc need to maintain populations there and we need to invest into infrastructure but also to bring in not just local populations that the outsiders who are willing to live in these difficult places we need to make sure they remain populated however you do it because this is a very very dangerous thing to do to let large chunks of the areas being unpopulated um, because that would uh, very quickly invite in you know in the short run it does these things don't matter but if you're taking a longer view of things these are dangerous things that can go into a spiral. So these are the various kinds of things we need to think about for, from a mountain state perspective. And of course, human capital requires that you take your education institution seriously, try to again, build up capacity there. How you do it, you have to invite scholars from the rest of the world to move there, but also bring back your own best talent from the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And not just in tourism and those sectors, but your best minds have to be willing to live in your states. It's, you know, just like NRIs sitting in Harvard telling uh, how India is best run, uh, is similarly, the same thing is true of people, Gyanis living in Delhi telling the people in Sikkim how to run their state. It does not matter if they happen to have Sikkimese names. Um, you want them to be living the life. They have to have skin in the game where they are living. So you please work hard to make sure your best, the best Arunachali brains, bring them back to Arunachal. The best Sikkimese brains have to be in Sikkim. The best Himachali brains have to be living in Himachal. That is what creates, uh, you know, hubs of intellectual idea, risk-taking. Bring your best 
uh, entrepreneurs back, bring your best writers back. You know, that's how you create hubs of activity. If they're all going off and living in Delhi, just because they went to study in LSR, um, you know, that is uh, your loss. Now I'm going to stop there and hand it back. Thank you very much, Sanjeevji. So, uh... With all you've, you've touched upon everything from the philosophical, uh, the altruistic, uh, right up to uh, the nut and bolts uh, of the entire ecosystem. Uh, so, uh, as we know it, now uh, on the because you've uh, uh, taken up uh, uh, the, the subject of Adman Nirbharta for uh, uh, as one of the core pillars, basically for uh, our future pivot in terms of where the, how the country can pivot forward. I have uh, uh, one of the first questions that's coming up is uh, from a fellow, uh, Eisenhower fellow, one of uh, uh, the former MP, he, uh, Mr. Peter, he basically asks about, uh, now this is in contrarian view to what uh, uh, our Honorable Prime Minister had said, for the 20 lakh crore economic stimulus on 12th of May, uh, it had raised both hopes and eyebrows, uh, eyebrows uh, while the important components in this package which will spur the economic uh, revival in the mountain states. Uh, so one is if we could get a little bit granular explanation if they, from there uh, for the mountain states. And the other thing is in terms of Atma Nirbharta, the contrarian uh, perspective, uh, the opinion that is there is uh, also you've taken a contrarian view to the universal basic income. Uh, by labeling it as a dependent syndrome. But uh, there were previous, I mean, you know, uh, like economic advisors like uh, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam, who basically uh, perpetrated the concept of uh, UBI. So that's the first question. So if you could just uh, briefly. Yeah, so I, 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 I am a great believer that Atma Dirbharta has to come with creating uh, ability to take risk, to stand on your own feet. And it requires, consequently, risk-taking. Now, any economy which encourages risk-taking and encourages people to stand up and do new things has to also have a safety net. After all, if you, when you go paragliding, you don't just jump off. You take with you safety equipment with you, right? So in the same, or you do any dangerous sport, you, take, you have to have a safety net. So the same idea is true here that you have to have a safety net if you create an economy that is based on risk-taking, churn, change, adaptability, etc. So that requires that you have to invest into things like um, uh, health insurance, direct transfer of benefits, and so on. So we are very much into providing safety nets. But providing a safety net is a very different men men mental conception from a universal basic income. A universal basic income means whether you're rich or poor, you will get a certain income that's universal. And it is a basic income that this income is provided to you whether you're in good times, bad times, and so on. And my argument is that is not Nirvarta at all. That is dependence. It is very different the idea that if you are poor and you've fallen ill, I give you insurance and make sure that you get treated. That's a totally different, that's a safety net idea. So I have to distinguish between the two because they, there is a very different, the way we frame policy, the how we direct that money, they are fundamentally different in the two ways. You're right that Arvind Subramaniam had talked about UBI, that's his view. I have clearly have a different view on the matter. So that is one. And you had talked about uh, what was the other the thing that you had said about the granularity of various of things about the package. Well, I didn't get into the granularity about it because I've, I have myself spoken about it on, 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 on various television shows. But basically, the idea there is also a safety net idea. So if you look at the kinds of policies we have so far done, we have so far thought of not really been putting in policies for the rebuild phase. What we are mostly still doing is the cushioning phase of this shock. So that is, given that barbell strategy I talked about, we have to cushion first for the worst case, then we have to step by step get into the rebuild phase. So the cushioning phase, what we have done, we have spent some resources by directly transferring some money. Now this is not, and this is not solving poverty, we are just cushioning people. 
We are giving them some food. We are providing some gas cylinders. All of this is merely to cushion people from the first round of shock. Same thing we are doing with industry. Because they might, if you don't do it, there'll be a cascade of uh, defaults. Not only businesses will go, you will also get large numbers of people losing jobs. And then you will get, get into a downward spiral. So this is the context in which, for example, 3 lakh crores worth of loans to MSMEs have been given 100% guarantee. Why? Because we want to make sure that some loans at least get out there. That's why we have uh, had a moratorium on repayments. We are also on the one-year moratorium on the insolvency and bankruptcy process. Why? Because we don't want a whole bunch of people to suddenly become bankrupt, then they end up in the bankruptcy process. Then one, the bankruptcy process itself will get jammed. And secondly, perfectly good companies, which are good companies in normal times, will suddenly be forced to be uh, declared insolvent. So we don't want that to happen. So again, these are all cushioning efforts. Now, this does not mean that we will not do more when we come into the rebuild phase, which we will now very shortly be coming into. Now, there's no point in doing a huge demand push when the country is still in lockdown. The whole point about the lockdown is that we are trying to restrain you from doing various economic activities. If you now begin to also feed demand at the same time, and on one hand, you are trying to pull them from doing that, there is no point. There's no point in giving, uh, say, a large tax benefits to, uh, say, GST cuts for restaurants and hotels when we are telling you that you can't actually go on a holiday, right? So the point here is there's only meaningful to create demand stimulus when you have opened the economy up in a way that the demand stimulus can actually have some effect. Otherwise, all that will happen, we'll spend the money on demand stimulus and nobody will spend it and you won't get the second and third order impacts of that spending. So this is an important part of what we are thinking. Now, as we go forward, we'll have to begin to think about what we do. We are already putting in place supply side measures, but we will also have to put now going forward some demand side measures. And there we have some fiscal space, particularly for doing large scale infrastructure. But unlike most countries in the world, which are mostly dependent on their fiscal side, because they've all, none of them have any monetary space. Most countries have used up their monetary space. They're already at zero interest rates. In India, we are still have significantly high interest rates. And one area where we can actually do quite a lot is to lower our structure of our interest rates. Uh, because we, unlike others, can provide a monetary stimulus. And you have seen RBI is systematically trying to lower interest rates. So that's part of our strategy. But yes, the supply side will be an important part of our overall strategy, unlike many other countries. Uh Sanjeev ji, you mentioned uh, demand stimulus. No? So, uh, does something like, uh, for example, our uh, demographic dividend also play into the long term? I mean, as compared to because you were in Singapore also. I just want to ask this person uh, this question. Yes, I mean, because, yeah, demographic, just because dividend, you mentioned, yeah. demographic dividend is in necessary, but it is not a sufficient condition for high growth. So, obviously, it also means we, we are, we, for, from around about uh, 2018 onwards, we entered our demographic, high demographic phase. And we will be there till the early uh, 2040s. So basically for the next 23, 24 years, we will be in this dem high demographic phase. We have already entered it, by the way. We, in, from here, it will accelerate and then it will peak out somewhere in the late 30s and then till the, somewhere in the mid 40s, it will peter out like where China is now. So we will be where China is now in round about circa 2045. So the next 25 years is our opportunity. This is for us to make it work. This is why this is the moment we have to got to leverage our young population to go out there and do new things. And this is very, very important that we are willing to do new things in a way that both maintains our local cultural base our ecological base, but at the same time allows us to new, do new things in, in various ways. So the deployment of that new human capital is very, very important. And this is true at a national level. It is also true, by the way, at the state level. So many, one of the things that came out of all of this is uh, the way UP chief minister has approached the migrant crisis. Many people, people may have seen this as a major problem. He is actually thinking of it as an opportunity, but because for a, after a long time, 
his best human capital is coming back home and so he is deploying them into all kinds of so you see the up government for once which is not historically known for being particularly investment friendly they are actually as a state going out and pitching to foreign companies to relocate to noida and other places they are doing major construction of highways and so on why are they doing it because human capital is coming back this is an opportunity wherever you can grab your best human capital grab it it is your demographic dividend is only useful if it is you can grab it and leverage it at the local level it is no point us having great human capital if it's going off to another country and winning nobel prizes for that country thank you uh so yeah uh, that's that's very interesting and also the thing is uh, what i've seen now is uh, especially from our question you know we got questions from ladakh to arunachal there is a huge chunk on the tourism uh, sector uh, people asking for the uh, you know is there is there going to be any kind of uh, swap or a grant specifically for the tourism industry Uh, i remember uh, honorable prime minister now is kind of like trying to uh, uh, the kedarnath route i mean he's he, he's gone and said that about you know maybe the no, so, way to so, we can uh, so improve or initialize two, this particular uh, yeah so there are two ways of thinking tourism. about what the government can do as i said giving sops um, may or may not be very beneficial if people are not coming on holiday after all i don't know anybody who is not going on a holiday because of gst so that is not the restraining factor so the restraining factor can be various things and i think governments should focus on doing those things rather than in doing <clears throat> useless sops which have no value and i know very often industry asks for these things but they should really think about what exactly they are asking and uh, before they ask for it because as i as somebody on the other side of this argument let me say what is really the use of asking for a cut in gst when say a place like darjeeling is in such poor shape what you really want is not tax cuts in darjeeling there may be other places why you want tax cuts but darjeeling really needs investment in sanitation and cleaning up that place it needs investment in you know redoing the mall area and upgrading it and modernizing it these are the things they we need investment there so the real problem in fact in india in tourism and this is not a uh, issue for just hill states is that we need to invest the government needs to invest both central government but more importantly state governments and even more importantly municipal governments in maintaining the sanctity of the places that we are opening up to tourism so you have of course have a strict policy in sikkim on getting rid of plastics um now this is something that every other state needs to do but plastics is not the only thing you need to care about there are water pollution there is all kinds of other pollution you need to think about and maintain the sanctity of your of your ecological systems and so uh, i think governments have a role to play in protecting these things so since the question was asked from ladakh uh even in ladakh you go now i you know i have by the way been trekking in ladakh from the 1999 i've been there many many times and when i used to first go there it used to be really pristine in we went off towards uh, zanskar that area there used to be almost nobody there you know you could trek for 3 4 days and not meet anybody from outside now they have become almost mass oh, it's okay more people are getting there it's not a bad thing necessarily but as a result of which there are plastic bottles everywhere there is all kinds of uh, you know uh, waste uh, plastic uh, these um, wrappers from biscuit wrappers all kinds of things which are dirtying that entire road and so uh, the point of the matter is this is the kinds of things in which the government should be spending i think there are certain things in which i'm generally skeptical of government involvement but there are certain things that governments or at least communities need to do to maintain those areas if tourism sector wants help they should force these governments to look after these things similarly look at the state of many of our monuments they are horrible i mean those of you who have had the misfortune of going to the taj mahal will know maybe a nice building 
but the experience of going to the Taj leaves you not very happy. You have to stand in a queue, there's Marpeet going on, 20 people trying to sell you things while you're standing in the queue. Then you go inside, there's complete chaos, you know, 40 people trying, uh, you know, there'll be guides, 40 guides jumping on top of you. You know, it's not organized. Now, I have been to so many places around the world, but you don't see that kind of chaos. So managing these things is an important part of what the governments need to do. Tax ops is actually the least of the things that tourism needs. So that's a, uh, so now the next question that we have is uh, actually in continuation to that, there was something else also basically on the Ladakh front, which was uh, about the harsh winter. It basically is a landlocked for the entirety of that uh, half a year. Uh, and also there is uh, like, I mean, no hope for recovery, but I think you've answered that question also well. And that question came from uh, Mr. Rigdin Spalbar, he's the former uh, chairman and the chief executive councillor of the Ladakh Autonomous Region. Now I have a question, the next question, uh, Sanjeeji, is from Dr. Drupal, uh, Drupal Chaudhary from EC Mode. And what he ask is, uh, asks is, uh, with the COVID situation uh, suggesting the need for enhancing self-reliance to increase resilience, what should the contours of self-reliance uh, uh, be so that it doesn't negate globalization and multilateral trade and economies? How can marginalized communities, such as those in the mountain, uh, mountain region, increase their self-reliance but not become insular in uh, today's uh, globalized economy? So he basically is on the, on the same path that you were discussing, but if you could just elaborate it just briefly. Yeah. So I, as I said, and I think the Prime Minister was very clear that self-reliance does not mean insularity. It merely means that people in different communities, uh, different states, realize that their future is very much in their hands and they need to think about resilience, not think about some planning commission a fellow uh, sitting in Delhi is, decides on the future of the country. This is a bad way of thinking about it. You're all stakeholders in this country and your stakeholders in your community. You need to be able to tell us what you want rather than the other way around. If there are things the state, central government should be doing, we are happy to do it. I mean, protecting your borders is one of them. You know, our troops will do it. There are certain heavy infrastructure things that need to be done, airports or whatever it is, we will do it. But there are things that you need to do at the local level and you have to capture the initiative on this. Um, and, and I think I talked about it earlier, maintaining your human capital base is a very important part of this. Maintain your cultural, uh, your cultural identity is important. Uh, as I said, Prime Minister is saying this over and over again, be vocal about local. These are important things because it's part of your resilience, social resilience, it's part of your even ecological resilience because each area developed a certain culture based on the logic of that area. So it is a very important part of how you think about yourselves. And of course, even from a tourism perspective, it's more interesting to go to a place which has a culture of its own. Otherwise, why should I leave Delhi and go to Ladakh? Um, you know, if it's, uh, the buildings look all the same. So, so the point here is very simple. The importance of culture. See, the very important part of, uh, uh, the, of Indian ethos, as opposed to the Chinese ethos, is that we believe plurality is our strength. So unlike the Chinese who may be going in to say, and trying to sinicize um, uh, uh, Tibet and sinicize uh, the Uyghurs, uh, we on the other hand, uh, we have the opposite view of the matter. We want the Sikkimese to come to Delhi and to, to, to serve us some good momos. We want the uh, Tamils to serve us better uh, dosas. Uh, so that is what we want. Uh, so we want the you know, cultural plurality to be a part of the thing. We don't want uh, everybody being made into one khichdi. That is not the part of our thinking process. So please be vocal about local and our mountain states are very special. So they need to maintain a certain speciality. And it's very sad when I find that the best young kids from all these mountain states, of course they come, they should come to Delhi to study. We very much encourage that. Uh, these, Delhi has great universities. I went to one of them. But I really want them to go back to their states and to take those states forward. That is one important way in which 
you pay, both have localized resilience, but you also have globalization. You have links to the world, but at the same time, you need to create your own, bring back your best. And in fact, you should be thinking of how to attract the best from the other states, compete with each other. So, so this is an important thing. I keep coming back to this because I find that this is a major, major problem. By the way, I very strongly feel about my own home state of West Bengal. And uh, there was a time when West Bengal used to be the intellectual, cultural, and even economic center of India. And uh, sadly, uh, round about the time that I was born, and I am presuming it's nothing to do with me, uh, you know, it, it went into this down, downhill turn. And so, you know, we, Bengal has today not produced anybody of the caliber of Satyajit Ray or Tagore or Vivekanand or uh, Netaji Subhash Bose. And unfortunately, now you're stuck with Sanjeev Sanya. And you can clearly see the graph is heading downward. So, therefore, the point I'm making to you is, uh, and even that Sanjeev Sanyal doesn't live in Kolkata. <laughs> so, the point of the matter I'm making to you is that, uh, that you need to bring your best back. And so, Kolkata, if I have to say, if I have to revive Kolkata, the first way I would start is to how to bring the best brains of Kolkata back to Kolkata and also to attract the best from Sikkim. And I will attract the bus for Arunachal. So I'm going to try and, this is called competitive federalism. We're going to try and steal your best guys. So your problem is to try and keep them there and steal mine. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. So, yeah. Uh, uh, that's, that's a very, very nicely answered uh, question. And also I can see that the, the thread that you're weaving is constantly coming to the same refrain of, uh, you know, building. Uh, you have to build capacity there. Yes, the sir. most important thing about any state, not just mountain states, but is that you have to build capacity there. But unfortunately, in the specific context of mountain states, you had a history of losing, continuously losing things, you know, losing people in particular. Okay. So uh, the... On that note, the next uh, question that I have is from uh, Mr. Uh, Sushil Ramola, who is the president of uh, IMI. And this question is from Uttarakhand. Uh, the Uttarakhand problem is about 3.5 lakh, uh, you know, uh, migrants uh, that have again come back into the state. And a significant number may, may not actually return uh, as they work in the hospitality sector, which will be probably the last to open. So. Now the one other avenue is put, put, putting them on some livelihood kind of activity like farms in the rural areas. So how can like the government work on creating farm oriented like micro entrepreneurs like you know, horticulture, medicinal plants or even construction and infrastructure uh, and preparing them for local jobs, you know, so that uh, the entrepreneurs... So I think, I think that is precisely the point I'm trying to make. Yes. That I think people in the states now need to take this issue of diversity, economic diversity seriously. So while tourism is a good thing, but as you can see, I think even if you go into medicinal plants, Hello, Sajiv ji, are you there? I think we are having a technical difficulty. Yeah, just please hold on. Huh? Uh, Sanjeev, you will come.
Hello. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Uh, Sanyal's uh, network is he's facing technical difficulty. So it's uh, basically dropped. He just gave me a call. Uh, so uh, he's having a technical difficulty and to get back in. However, so we've also exceeded our time. Actually, it's five just in these conversations. These are things that can happen. Uh, we are living in the new normal. So all of these things are par for the course. Um, and we have to take it with stride. It will not, it, it will not move uh, as smoothly as always. There are some very interesting questions that have come up. I will try to uh, uh, compile them and send it to Mr. Sanyal. He's asked for any questions that are there. Uh, so he can answer them and and then to all the attendees i will send it back to you uh, i would want i want to thank everybody uh, who participated today uh, who, who came on the uh, and was watching us uh, watching us live and also who's basically here on our uh, webinar uh, thank you very much uh, and specifically to all our partners that uh, basically partnered with us through this process uh, from Sikkim Chronicle, I would want to, uh, Sikkim Chronicle, then uh, Finer, uh, then we have uh, East Mojo, uh, then NetFee, uh, NetFee IMI, Integrated Modern uh, Initiative, and, uh, uh, and also thank you very much to uh, our team here, Namrata, Amrita, uh, thank you very, very much. And so we'll catch up in the next uh, event. Uh, unfortunately, this was very little time uh, and we had this technical problem, but these are, these are things that will happen and uh, these are things to be expected. Uh, so I thank you very much for attending. Uh, more in the next and see you soon.